I want to find a bigger life. I want to amount to something. These are the words of Bessie Coleman, featured here on Beautiful Gray Sponge. Born Elizabeth Coleman in Atlanta, Texas on January 26th, 1892, to a poor black family, the 10th of 13 children. Her father, George Coleman, was one quarter African American and three quarters Choctaw and Cherokee. Her mother, Susan, was an encouraging figure, raising her family. Only nine of her 13 children survived childhood, which was actually typical for the time. When Coleman was two years old, her family moved from Atlanta, Texas, to Waxahachie, Texas, where they lived as sharecroppers. I've come across the term of sharecropping before, but never really understood it for what it was. Basically, an exploitative system, where landlords provided supplies on credit and meager housing in exchange for half the crops, usually cotton, that the tenants farmed and harvested. Think of Steinbeck's novel, The Grapes of Wrath. I learned that this historical practice perpetuated a cycle of economic dependency among an impoverished working class, and that, while it's really not in use in the United States today, it's still seen around the world in poor countries like Bangladesh, Ghana, Zimbabwe, India, and Pakistan. So likely as a result of these living conditions and frustrated by the racial oppression of Jim Crow laws in Texas, in 1901, her father wanted to return to Oklahoma, to Indian Territory, as it was called then, to find better opportunities. But Susan didn't want to go, so she raised four of their children by herself, earning money as a domestic worker, staying in Waxahachie. And at the age of six, Coleman began attending school there. She walked four miles each day to the segregated one-room school, where she loved to read and established herself as an outstanding student, especially excelling in math. She loved learning so much that during harvest time, when the schools were closed and Bessie worked in the cotton fields, she'd still eagerly borrow books from the wagon library and educate herself. After eight years in the one-room schoolhouse, at age 12, Bessie was accepted into the Missionary Baptist Church School on scholarship, completing her secondary education. Then, when she turned 18, she took her savings and enrolled in the Oklahoma Colored Agricultural and Normal University in Langston, Oklahoma, now called Langston University. She was only able to complete one term before running out of funds. She returned home to Texas to earn money washing clothes. I pause here, reflecting on her words. I want to find a bigger life. I want to amount to something. During this time, amidst the disappointment of not completing her college degree and still a vivacious young adult, how did she spend her days? What was she thinking? Could she have resigned herself to this position as a sharecropper, domestic worker, or laundress? Would she have been content? Many accounts described her as stubborn and determined. I think she was always going to keep striving, and something prompted her, because around 1915, in her early 20s, Coleman moved to Chicago, Illinois, where she lived with her brothers, Walter and John. It was in Chicago that she attended beauty school. The school was called the E. Burnham School of Beauty Culture. Once trained, she worked as a manicurist at the White Sox Barbershop in the city's south side. Apparently, she was pretty good even winning a contest through the Black Weekly newspaper, The Chicago Defender, as the best and fastest manicurist in the area. While Bessie was exploring a bigger life in Chicago's backyard, across the globe, there was a war building. One that started July 28, 1914, when Austria declared war on Serbia. By 1917, when the U.S. entered what became the notorious First World War, her brothers had enlisted with the Illinois All-Black 8th Army National Guard and sailed to France. It was also in 1917 that Bessie married. On January 30th, she married Claude Glenn, who was 14 years her senior. That means he was 14 years older. But 
this was a blip in her life. Apparently she never even informed her family, or lived with him, or used his name, and the two separated shortly after. As an aside, across the many sources of information I read, I only came across two references that even slightly mentioned her being married at all. While still working at the barber shop in 1918, after the Great War ended, Bessie would listen to the flying stories of pilots returning home to the United States. One day, her brother John, who'd served in France, playfully provoked her by saying, I know something that French women do that you'll never do. Fly. That one remark instigated Coleman, and she decided she absolutely would. She'd learn to fly and become an aviatrix. So she took a second job to save money quickly and pursue her dream to be a pilot. But when she applied to U.S. flight schools, every school rejected her because she was black and a woman. American flight schools of the time admitted neither. Bessie faced many obstacles directly and indirectly. In the summer of 1919, she witnessed the worst race riot in the history of Chicago. In fact, the worst riot across the U.S. during what became known as the Red Summer across the country that year. Racial tensions exacerbated after World War I as more African Americans migrated north competing for industrial labor in factories, while they also sought adequate housing in overcrowded urban ghettos. Black war veterans who'd fought to preserve democracy stood up against the mistreatment of their racist neighbors to fight oppression and demand justice. Eventually, even President Woodrow Wilson would condemn the white race as the aggressor in what ignited the riot in Chicago that summer, and which continues to reverberate even today, more than a hundred years later. Having witnessed and experienced this conflict, Bessie was not only determined to learn how to fly, but she also vowed to fight against racism, sexism, poverty, and ignorance. While in Chicago, Bessie met Robert Abbott, the publisher of the Chicago Defender, which grew to have the highest circulation of any black-owned newspaper in the country then. I'm guessing she met him when she won that contest as the best and fastest manicurist on the South Side. Abbott encouraged Bessie to study flying abroad instead. And later she received financial backing from both him and Jesse Binga, a prominent American businessman who founded the first privately owned African-American bank in Chicago. But she also put her own skin in the game. She learned the French language by taking night classes at the Burlet's Language School in Chicago and took a second job as a restaurant manager of a chili parlor to save money. Then, in 1920, she enrolled in the Cauldron Brothers School of Aviation in Le Crotoy, France. To travel there, she filed for her U.S. passport, claiming to be four years younger. I'm not sure what advantage she would have had with claiming to be younger, and I'm still curious about what prompted her to do this, but I never came across this answer in my research. Regardless of her age, she was ready. In 1920, she prepared for her first voyage to Europe and set sail for Paris, France on November 20th, 1920. Once she arrived, she began training, learning to fly in a rickety Newport 564 biplane with a steering system that consisted of a vertical stick, the thickness of a baseball bat, placed in front of the pilot and a rudder bar under the pilot's feet. Rickety. She understood the realities and risks involved. I read that she actually witnessed a fellow training student crash to their death. But she remained steadfast and tenacious. She completed the 10-month training course in seven months. On June 15th, 1921, she graduated and earned the highly respected Federation Aeronautique Internationale becoming the first American to receive this international pilot's license in France. Bessie was not the first black woman, or even the only woman in her class, to receive a license from the FAI. But she was the first American, even before famed Amelia Earhart, who earned hers in 1923. And yes, Coleman was the first black person and first Native American pilot in the United States, to earn an international aviation license. 
But before returning to the United States, she wanted to polish her skills even more and spend another two months taking lessons from a French ace pilot near Paris. Then, in September of 1921, she finally set sail back to America. Once home, she became a media sensation. First in New York, she was praised and entertained by the black community. They invited her to the play Shuffle Along, the first successful musical in the U.S. starring black performers. But her return home was brief. In 1922, stunt flying was all the rage, known as barnstorming. Stunt flyers performed dangerous tricks in the air with beat-up airplanes for paying audiences. Americans were fascinated by daredevil flying, part circus, part sport. But to succeed in this highly competitive arena, she'd need advanced lessons and a more extensive repertoire. Unable to find anyone willing to teach her these risky maneuvers in the U.S., she set sail to Europe once again. After arriving, Coleman spent the first two months in France, completing an advanced course in aviation. After that, she decided to travel to the Netherlands, where she met Anthony Fokker, a distinguished Dutch aviation pioneer, entrepreneur, aircraft designer, and aircraft manufacturer. The Fokker Corporation in Germany welcomed her and gave her an additional 10 weeks of training from one of the company's best pilots. Finally satisfied with her improved flying skills, she returned to the United States to launch her career in exhibition flying. She made her first appearance in an American air show on September 3rd, 1922, at an event honoring veterans of the all-black 369th Infantry Regiment of World War I. Held at Curtis Field on Long Island near New York City and sponsored by her friend Abbott from the Chicago Defender paper, the show promoted Coleman as the world's greatest woman flyer. Eight other American ace pilots flew as part of the air show as well, and included a daring jump by black parachutist Hubert Julian. Six weeks later, Coleman returned to Chicago, performing in an air show, this time to honor World War I's 370th Infantry Regiment. With all of her advanced training, she delivered a stunning demonstration of daredevil maneuvers. Imagine figure eights, loops, barrel rolls, and near-ground dips. She even walked on the wings and parachuted out. As a pilot, petite Bessie Coleman quickly established herself as a force to be reckoned with, earning the nicknames Queen Bess and Brave Bessie. She toured the country as a barnstormer, performing aerobatics at hundreds of air shows. As I mentioned before, barnstorming was all the rage during the Roaring Twenties. At the end of World War I, many trained pilots were left out of work. On top of that, the military had a surplus of aircraft, mostly the Curtis JN-4 biplane, known as Jenny, which they sold to former aviators and civilians for a fraction of their original price. The combination of the former pilot's boredom and bravery with access to inexpensive planes, eventually led to the rise of barnstorming as a popular source of entertainment. Barnstorming earned its nickname because aerobatic pilots would use farm fields to land their planes, and the local barns were used as venues for the crowds of paying spectators as they watched these daring pilots attempt a variety of dangerous tricks. The thrill of stunt flying and the admiration of cheering crowds were only part of Coleman's childhood vow, to one day amount to something. As a professional aviator, Coleman often would be criticized by the press for her opportunistic nature and her flamboyant demeanor. For example, she learned that dramatic storytelling enticed the crowd, and so she'd embellish or fabricate stories about her life. Some of the things she was recorded as saying were things like, she served for the Red Cross in Europe during World War I, where she learned to fly. How she met German royalty and diplomats. Or that she'd flown a large German seaplane. Were these all false claims? Perhaps. 
She enjoyed the thrill of being the entertainer, much like her New Yorker friends who performed on stage. She loved the bigger-than-life persona. Through her media contacts, she even was offered a role in a feature-length film titled Shadow and Sunshine. She gladly accepted, hoping the publicity would help advance her career and provide her with some of the money she needed to establish her own flying school, an even bigger dream she had. After she discovered that the role required her to appear in tattered clothes with a walking stick and a pack on her back, she refused. Biographer Doris Rich wrote, quote, Clearly, Bessie's walking off the movie set was a statement of principle. Opportunistic though she was about her career, she was never an opportunist about race. She had no intention of perpetuating the derogatory image most whites had of most blacks. End quote. Indeed, she also refused to play an ignorant black country girl who goes to the big city because she felt it was demeaning to women. Committed to promoting aviation to women and marginalized groups, she combated racism by absolutely refusing to participate in aviation events that prohibited the attendance of African Americans, or even in shows that forced black and white spectators to enter through separate gates. She was quoted as saying, the air is the only place free from prejudice. After the movie opportunity fell through, she decided to stay in California and explore a potential advertising partnership with a rubber company. It made tires for planes. But even this did not pan out as she'd hoped. During a flight in the winter of 1923, her plane stalled and crashed near Los Angeles. She broke a leg and three ribs. It would be two more years before she'd fly again. After healing from her injuries, she began giving aviation lectures in places like Texas, Georgia, and Florida. A Baptist minister and his wife invited her to spend two months with them in Orlando. Here she opened a beauty shop to raise more money for her aviation school. She wrote to a sister that she was nearing enough capital to open the school and to purchase another plane to replace the one destroyed in the California crash and began her exhibitions again. And she did. She bought a used plane. Another Curtis JN4 stored in Dallas, Texas. Because she was still in Florida, she decided to pay a mechanic pilot, 24-year-old William D. Wills, to fly the plane to her in Florida. The plane wasn't in great shape. Wills' air travel alone lasted over 21 hours from Texas to Florida. He had to make multiple forced landings en route. But... She was scheduled to fly again May 1st in Jacksonville for members of the city's Negro Welfare League at the nearby fairgrounds, and there wasn't enough turnaround time to mess with it. As she'd often do in her more than 350 previous air shows, she planned to preview the ground for her parachute jump. The day was April 30th, 1926. On takeoff, Wills was flying the recently acquired plane. Coleman sat in the other seat so she could examine the terrain as seen from the cockpit. To get a good view, she wasn't strapped in her seat during the overfly. Then, only ten minutes into the flight, the plane unexpectedly went into a dive, spinning at 3,000 feet above the ground. Coleman was thrown from the plane at approximately 2,000 feet and was killed instantly when she hit the ground. Every bone crushed. According to one eyewitness on the ground, Wills appeared to briefly regain control and attempt a landing, only to crash into a tree. The plane hanging from the tree upside down was a mess of tangled debris. It was reported that one of the first persons on the scene, without thought, lit a cigarette, igniting the plane and the pilot's body in the wreckage. Although the plane was badly burned, it was later discovered that it was a wrench used to service the engine that had jammed the controls when it fell into a gearbox. Thousands of people mourned Bessie's death, from Jacksonville and Orlando to Chicago, where her body was transported by train. Funeral services were held in each city. While there was little mention in most media, news of her death was widely carried in the African-American press. 
10,000 mourners attended her ceremony in Chicago, which was led by activist Ida B. Wells. And although she wasn't able to establish a school for young black aviators in her lifetime, her pioneering achievements served as an inspiration for a generation of African-American men and women. Because of Bessie Coleman, wrote Lieutenant William J. Powell in Black Wings 1934, we have overcome that which was worse than racial barriers. We have overcome the barriers within ourselves and dared to dream. Powell served in a segregated unit during World War I and tirelessly promoted the cause of black aviation through his book, his journals, and the Bessie Coleman Aerial Club, which he founded in 1929, created and named in her honor. Despite her short life, it was, indeed, a big life. Coleman's legacy of flight endures. She's credited with inspiring generations of African-American aviators, male and female, including the Tuskegee Airmen and NASA astronaut Dr. Mae Jemison. On the Space Shuttle Endeavor, when Jemison became the first African-American woman in space in September of 1992, she carried Bessie Coleman's picture with her. Bessie Coleman is buried in Lincoln Cemetery in Blue Island, Illinois, near Chicago. Since 1931, each year on the anniversary of her death, black pilots, men and women, fly over Bessie Coleman's grave and drop flowers in her honor. As an important footnote to barnstorming, the risks soon led to enforced safety regulations. By limiting how low in altitude certain tricks could be performed, it was nearly impossible for spectators to see what was happening in the air. Eventually, these restrictions brought an end to barnstorming as a profitable career. Over the last century, Coleman's received many posthumous awards and recognitions. A few notable mentions. In 2001, Coleman was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. In 2006, Coleman was inducted into the National Aviation Hall of Fame. Coleman was placed number 14 on Flying's 2013 list of the 51 Heroes of Aviation. In 2021, the International Astronomical Union named a mountain and possible volcano on Pluto, Coleman Mountain, in her honor. For all you coin collectors out there, Coleman's now been honored on an American Women Quarter in 2023. And for all you Barbie fans, in 2023, Mattel added a Bessie Coleman Barbie doll to its Inspiring Women series. And that's it. The life, the big life, of Bessie Coleman. Thank you for choosing to learn and connect with me a post relying solely on, or if at all, chat GPT for your insatiable curiosity. I'm sure there are benefits to this advanced and shiny technological tool, but I like getting my hands dirty and digging in the depths. I like the research I get to do that makes my brain hurt so good. And the writing, the scripting, the recording. Sure, it's more time consuming. But even I feel like I'm cheating when I think of all the past figures who disseminated information and ideas before any digital tools were even available. I feel lucky that I get to type and use the internet, electronic books, databases, podcasts, you name it, to do my research from the comfort of my own home. Potentially, ChatGPT consolidates everything on a topic, right? I haven't compared Chat's iteration to mine yet. I could lose some listeners to chat, but not my love for learning. I like the effort I put into the work of extracting, analyzing, and synthesizing. I'm so grateful for a brain that has the potential to think critically. So I choose to use this one and only edition of complex neurons housed in an approximate three pound mass within my skull to help me in creating beautiful gray sponge. A purposeful play on words to name a podcast for learning and connecting. So for now, from my sponge to yours, thank you for listening. <laughs>